In the dimly lit back aisles of most U.S. aquarium stores, next to the feeder goldfish, you'll find rosy red minnows. There are North American species bred in bait ponds around the U.S. They're typically relegated to overcrowded tanks and sold as feeders for big cichlids and other predatory aquarium species. Like a certain bygone comedian, they get absolutely no respect. I think the rosy red minnow is the most underrated species in the hobby. First, they're really inexpensive. I bought mine for 15 US cents a piece. Given a clean tank and aerated water, they're active and lively. They have a subdued but respectable orange color like rice fish. And they do well in a wide range of water conditions, from a pH in the high sixes to high sevens, and from moderately soft water to moderately hard water. They aren't fussy eaters and will take all kinds of flake foods and small pellets. They do fine at room temperatures and don't need a heater like the more delicate tropicals do. But it can be difficult to get them started. Because of the crowded conditions they're kept in, they often carry diseases. Many soon die off after you bring them home. In this video, I'll tell you how to successfully keep rosy reds, including how I treated my fish to get them healthy, and how I bred them to produce a next generation. My name is Bob, and this is Sonny's Fish Room. The rosy red minnow is the xanthic or orange variety of the fathead minnow, Pimephalus promelis. They're called fatheads because breeding males develop a thickening around the head. Wild type fatheads are a silvery gray. Peterson's Field Guide to Freshwater Fishes says fatheads can tolerate muddy water and lower oxygen levels. The fish's range extends over much of North America, from central Canada, south to Texas, and over to the central and eastern United States. A popular bait fish, the fathead minnow has been introduced to areas outside its native range, probably from bait bucket releases and escapes from private ponds. In an article in the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, writer Keith Sutton credits fish farmer Bill Bland with developing the orange strain of the fathead minnow from fish that appeared in his ponds in the early 1980s. In a 2000 article in American Currents, the publication of the North American Native Fishes Association, Bob Muller says that he believes rosy reds may be a hybrid of fathead minnows and related pimephalus species. Features of some rosy reds he examined resemble those of other pimephalus species. Spawning male rosy reds will claim a nesting spot on the underside of a rock or branch or inside a flower pot. Females will lay adhesive eggs that stick to the nesting spot. Unlike most other North American minnow species which scatter their eggs, male rosy reds guard theirs until they hatch. In 2011, I spawned wild type rosy reds in a flower pot. I hatched the fry, but the adults developed progressive weight loss, sometimes called skinny disease, and soon died. The disease passed through my fish room and wiped out the loaches, limias, and other species I was keeping at the time. I was afraid of exposing my fish room to skinny disease, so I hadn't tried keeping rosy reds again until this year. I thought I could prevent any diseases they carried from spreading if I was careful. I kept them in a single tank. I soaked nets and other equipment I used in their tanks in hot water to prevent any infections from spreading to my other fish. First, I tried quarantining 20 rosy reds in a 10-gallon tank, hoping a few would survive. But over the next two weeks, all of them died. My guess is that most rosy reds are exposed to a low level of diseases and parasites in the ponds they're raised in. Their immune systems keep low-level infections under control, but the stress of capture and shipment lowers their resistance. In the crowded store feeder tanks, diseases spread from just a few sick fish to all the others. It's similar to how a bad cold will spread from one kid in a classroom to all the kids. After my first group of rosy reds died, I bought 50 more from a local shop. I knew most wouldn't survive, so I started with more than I needed, hoping a few might pull through. I made sure they weren't stressed by a dirty tank. I did daily water changes, replacing 80 to 90 percent of the water each time with clean tap water aged for 24 hours. I checked the Merck Manual online reference, Parasitic Diseases of Fish, 
to see if I could find out what parasite might cause fish to progressively lose weight and how to treat it. That wasn't much help. I learned that fish can get lots of parasites, too many to identify by symptoms alone without a microscope. And for many parasites, it's not known which treatments work best. In addition to probable internal parasites, many of them also had signs of external parasites. I suspect that some of the external parasites I saw don't travel from fish to fish, but probably complete their life cycle in birds or larger fish that eat the rosy reds. To keep them from losing weight, I fed them my homemade fish food formula, which has lots of protein. I added fresh garlic to it, which some references say treats certain fish internal parasites. Then I rotated them through a course of several different medications. Since I didn't know what they were infected with and what treatments would kill their infections, I tried a broad spectrum of medications that would each treat several different organisms. My strategy was to treat for multiple days in a row, repeating each treatment four to six times. I started with Paragard, switched to Paracleanse, then Prazapro, followed by Expel-P, and ended up with Metrocleanse. By this time, I'd lost about half the fish, but the dying finally stopped and the survivors were looking better. But their poop was still long and stringy, which some hobbyists say is a sign of internal parasites. I noticed that the fish were picking at the tank bottom. I've read online posts from other hobbyists saying treatments don't kill internal parasites, but only paralyze them so they can pass out of the fish's system. It's possible, I thought, that they were pooping out small parasites or eggs and then eating them and getting reinfected. Then I tried something from a scientific reference I found. Researchers had added 1 gram of Panicure C, a dewormer for small dogs, to 100 grams of powdered gel fish formula and fed it once a day for two days. They reported that while some aquarium species didn't do well on it, others were okay. Before we go on, I need to warn you that this treatment could weaken or even kill your fish. It depends on the species. The treatment was hardest on New World bottom-dwelling species. This included Mad Tom's darters, pencil fish, as well as Corydoras and other small Amazon catfishes. I thought my rosy reds would die of skinny disease if I didn't get rid of their parasites. So I took the risk. I took a chance and made up a batch to feed my fish. I had a sample bottle of Rapashi left over from a fish club meeting. It was 85 grams, a little less than the 100 grams of gel formula the researchers used in their study. I didn't have a scale to weigh out 0.85 grams of Panicure C, so I poured out a little more than three quarters of the package and mixed it with the Rapashi food. I fed it to the fish once a day for about a month. I stopped feeding it for a week and the rosy reds seemed healthy, so I figured the treatment had worked. At this point, I had about 25 to 35 fish left. Before we go on, I want to point out that when I'm treating fish for internal parasites, I like to use a strong power head with a pre-filter. I think that if the fish are shedding any eggs or small parasites, the pre-filter will pick them up and keep the fish from getting reinfected. Now I was ready to try breeding the fish. I converted my 40-gallon show tank into a breeding tank. I took out the driftwood and rocks and replaced them with flower pots to serve as spawning caves. I conditioned the breeders with more of my homemade food. In 1997, John Buchanan Clayton, a student at Texas Tech, published a master's thesis showing that fathead minnows need about 14 hours of daylight to spawn. I set the timer on the tank for 14 hours. The tank was at room temperature ranging from 68 to 72 degrees. I waited a couple of weeks but didn't see any eggs. It wasn't until I changed the pre-filters on the power heads that I found out why. The rosy reds spawned on the back of the pre-filter covering instead of in the flower pots. I removed the filter cover with the eggs and dropped a stone into the center so it would sink to the bottom. I put an air stone inside and moved it to an empty tank full of green water, thinking the fry would eat the floating algae cells as a first food. I fed them what I usually feed young fish, vinegar eels, hard-boiled egg yolk, and fine-grade golden pearls. I don't know why, but almost all the fry died. In the next couple of months, I tried again with later spawns. I vacuumed the tank daily with a coral feeder and changed about a half gallon of water each day. I also had a cleanup crew of snails and shrimp culls to eat any leftover food. 
Although I didn't have as many deaths as I did with the green water tank, I lost one to two fish per day. My theory is that rosy reds are bred in outdoor ponds, so the fry may not have good resistance to the microorganisms that live in my fish room, like the white cloud minnows and shield Achilles that I've raised for years do. I'm hoping that the rosy reds that survived have some genetic resistance to the organisms in my tanks, and they'll pass this resistance on to their offspring. I hope the next generation of rosy reds has a better survival rate than this generation did. It hasn't been easy, but I think these common overlooked fish have been worth the effort. They like indoor temperatures, so I don't need to heat their tanks. They're easy enough to breed. Just give them 14 hours or more of light each day to trigger spawning. The eggs are easy to collect. They're lively, active swimmers, so they're fun to watch. And their light orange color makes them an attractive addition to any tank. I'm hoping to selectively breed fish with darker shades of orange. Maybe I can develop a strain that has the deep orange of common goldfish. I've always liked common goldfish, but they grow too big. Rosy reds won't outgrow my tanks. I also think the rosy red's orange color will go well with the dark purple of male black ruby barbs, which I've also started keeping recently. Maybe someday I'll set up a show tank featuring the two species. If you liked this video, here's another one you might also like. For more videos on fish or fish keeping, please subscribe to this channel. It would also help me out if you could share this video with someone you think might like it. Thanks for watching.